In today's episode, we will talk about when the legendary general and emperor, Napoleon Bonaparte, met his Waterloo. Well, not actually Waterloo, but as in the expression to meet your war. Forget it. Hello and bienvenu, bienvenido, and benvindu to Feature History, featuring the Peninsula War, which I recall once in this series claiming to be a failure. It seems, however, that even a man of godlike perfection such as myself is prone to mistakes. Enough about myself, though, as interesting as I am. Instead, let's indulge a scene. In 1808, one man ruled Europe, and that man was Napoleon Bonaparte. Italians, Germans, Austrians, Russians, all humbled before him. His unparalleled power left him unrivaled on the continent. But across the channel, his true enemy eluded him, Great Britain. The two, unable to best each other, remained in a perpetual state of war in the early 19th century. But allow me to roll back a tad. In the late 18th century, the French Revolution happened. We all know what happened, we all know when it happened, and we all bloody well know what it did. So I'll spare you the details. During it, however, the Great French War began. The French Revolutionary Government would find itself at war with everyone on the continent. And with this war began the rise of a young Napoleon. He took some decisive victories in Italy and some fairly murky ones in Egypt. In 1799, he'd flee the front lines of war for the back rooms of politics to allow for a coup d'etat that installed himself as the first consul of France. He'd soon after, in 1802, sign the Treaty of Amiens, making peace with the British, Austrians, Russians, Portuguese, Ottomans, Neapolitans, Tuscans. It goes on. In doing so, France had confirmed itself as a sovereign republic, and taken many client states and sister republics, and when they weren't beating around the bush, straight up annex places. This status quo did not satisfy Napoleon, and certainly didn't please his rivals. Hostilities would resume in 1803 with the War of the Third Coalition. In it, France and their ally Spain's navies were shat all over in the Battle of Trafalgar, but on the continent Napoleon reigned supreme. By 1807, Napoleon was Emperor of the French, had destroyed the Holy Roman Empire, seized much German land, humiliated Prussia, Russia, Austria, Sweden, and generally confused the whole map with his many, many satellite states. However, he would not have a way to invade Britain. The English Channel did far better than any wall could ever do, and simply France had no navy to equal his majesties. Napoleon would instead fight with a weapon more powerful than any army, or navy, or other thing. He'd fight economically. In 1806, Napoleon decreed a large embargo against the British Empire and their trade. This was to be later known as the Continental System. From Russia to Spain, just about every possible coast that Britain could land refused their trade, as they had learnt to fear Napoleon and heed his decrees. There was but one exception to this system, and that was Portugal. As Britain's ally for over 400 years, the two countries were besties and Portugal refused to conform. Napoleon would respond with a dual French and Spanish invasion of Portugal in the autumn of 1807. The Portuguese offered little resistance, and their royal family simply fled to Brazil, leaving the French and Spanish to carve up the abandoned kingdom. Those two nations had been allies for some time now, about a decade, and Spain had found itself trapped in France's non-stop warring. Napoleon saw the Spanish as unable to pull their weight, whereas the Spanish prince, Ferdinand VII, started to see the French as responsible for the destruction of Spain's navy and alienation from their colonies. A political struggle in the Spanish crown would break out. The king, Charles VI, selected his favourite, Manuel de Godoy, to lead as prime minister. Ferdinand hated Godoy, as the man seemed pro-French. Napoleon also hated the prime minister, seeing him as pro-British. So, with an abstruse Prime Minister making a power play, a conspiracy for Ferdinand to usurp his father, and growing French distrust in Spain, Napoleon seemed eager to cut this crap at its foundation. Under the pretext of sending reinforcements to Portugal, a hundred thousand French soldiers had simply found themselves in Spain. So when in March 1808 the princes supported mutinied and deposed Charles, Napoleon would invite both to Bayonne to allow for the Emperor to mediate for them. It was, however, a trap. Napoleon arrested the two, forcing them to renounce the throne in favour of his brother, Joseph Bonaparte, becoming King Joseph I of Spain. French soldiers made their way to all major centres of Spain as the indigenous people were very displeased. In early May, Madrid had rose up in the Dos de Mayo uprising in protest of French occupation and the abduction of their royal family. The French soldiers would seek brutal reprisals against the population, only provoking a mass Iberian insurrection. Sporadic fighting erupted across the peninsula, and for the first time in name, guerrilla fighting would be witnessed. French columns scattered across Spain in an attempt to pacify revolt, constantly harassed in transit by militias formed from both soldiers and civilians. Napoleon could only see this as a temporary setback, and that it was inevitable the sedition would be suppressed. 
However, the Battle of Bailen in July saw a Spanish army defeat a French one decisively. It seemed the French would have to commit more and more focus to the region than first anticipated. Given the new theatre, opportunists in Britain saw a chance to open a new land front against Napoleon. In August, an expeditionary force of 30,000 men under General Arthur Wellesley, future Duke of Wellington, would land in Portugal to drive out the French and connect later with Spanish resistance. The general's earliest move saw him deal an unexpected defeat to the French in the Battle of Vimaro. The French retreat offered an opportunity for Wellesley to crush that army. However, his command would be superseded by General Dalrymple. The man, lacking either confidence or intelligence, or both, signed the Convention of Sintra. It permitted the French to evacuate Portugal with all their weapons, men, and loot. The convention was outrageous to those in Portugal and Britain. Dalrymple would receive the sack and Wellesley, though eventually cleared of blame, was taken off. The seasoned general, Sir John Moore, would take over command for the remainder of the expedition. King Joseph would be driven from Madrid by the Spanish people around the same time. It had set a trend as he was forced to abdicate four times over the duration of the war. In response to this and more, Napoleon realised everyone had lost their head, and so he and his Grand Army entered Spain personally. Moore and the British would drive north, pulling Napoleon's focus from the insurrectionists in the south. When the Grand Army approached Moore's expedition, he was forced into a harrowing retreat through the winter of 1808 to 1809. They'd end in the Dunkirk-esque Battle of Coronia in January 1809. Moore would be struck down by a cannonball as the British evacuated to ships, covered by their own compatriots and Spanish fighters. The sacrifice was not in vain, as the survivors would successfully return to Britain. When the public witnessed the distressing sight of their battered troops wearing rags and wounds, it became apparent the peninsula would demand for total war. With Portugal once again abandoned, its residents would claim the British are for the sea, as the audacious French marshal, Jean de Dussault, reinvaded Portugal, taking Oporto in the north. At the same time, Austria would begin the War of the Fifth Coalition, which drew Napoleon from Spain to Central Europe. General Wellesley would return to Portugal shortly after and assume control of an Anglo-Portuguese force. He'd push the French from Oporto and Portugal in May and begin his approach to Madrid. He and his Spanish allies would come so close in July, but a preemptive French strike saw the Battle of Talavera. It'd be a costly victory, Wellesley, now officially Viscount of Wellington, losing a quarter of his men, forcing his retreat back to Portugal. He'd start replenishing his forces and constructing the lines of Torres Vedras, a set of impenetrable defences surrounding Lisbon. 1809 closed with Austria's defeat, and 1810 carried on with little action until September, where France once again invaded Portugal. Upon approaching Wellington's creation, they could do little but wait, and soon winter came and forced an embarrassing retreat across 1811. Wellington could finally return to the offensive in January 1812. He had proven himself as a defensive mastermind, but his offensive had remained to show. To break into Spain, he sieged both Ciudad Rodrigo and Badajoz. Badajoz saw mass atrocity committed, as no one was spared the bloodbath the offensive had become. Wellington would rein his men back under control and take victory in Salamanca, that then allowed him to enter and liberate Madrid in August. It seemed as if the tide had turned, and France itself would soon be open to the British. Only Burgos remained. Wellington's siege would be in vain, as he was repelled in October. He retreated from Burgos, then from Madrid, and then from Badajoz across the winter. After much sacrifice, it ended up right back where they started. The same winter, however, saw Napoleon driven from Russia in a spectacular retreat after having early invaded in June of 1812. As he backpedaled across Europe, the Prussians, Austrians, and Swedes came out against him in the War of the Sixth Coalition. Lastly, the winter had also seen increased harassment from unrelentless Spanish guerrillas. They had been a costly thorn in Napoleon's side since the start and now the reignited war in the rest of Europe saw reinforcements to Spain suspended. Wellington re-entered Spain with his biggest and best army yet in May. He thrust forward into the country, avoiding Badajoz. The French armies were caught off guard as Wellington headed north. His manoeuvres caused them to pull from Madrid to reorganise. They could not let Wellington simply sidestep them into France. King Joseph and his armies would finally set up a defensive position in Vittoria, only to be decisively crushed and routed in the ensuing battle. When Napoleon heard, he was outraged at his own brother, stating, If there was a man too many, it was the king. Barring Joseph's return to Paris, Ferdinand VII would see his release the following year to finally take back his place as king of Spain. The Peninsular War had turned irreversibly against the French, and the larger war threatened to do the same. Wellington would struggle with Marshal Soult across the Pyrenees for months, finally breaking into France itself in October 1813. He'd, however, only see off Soult at the Battle of Ortez in February of 1814. 
The coalition's resolve was tested greatly in Napoleon's vigorous defence of France in the early months of 1814, but Paris would fall in March. Wellington would siege the city of Toulouse in April, only receiving news of Napoleon's abdication after the city had fallen. After a long struggle on both the behalf of Spanish guerrillas, the Portuguese army and the British expedition, they had done the impossible and defeated Napoleon. They had through thick and thin stood as a steadfast middle finger to Napoleon. Of course, Napoleon returned and famously fought the Battle of Waterloo against no other than Wellington himself, who, admittedly narrowly, defeated Napoleon. France carried on as a monarchy after, but old habits die hard and they'd witnessed some more revolutions and empires across the 19th century. Wellington received much fame for his achievements and used them to lead a political career back home, and so you can't help but receive a somewhat propagandized view of him. Under occupation, Spain had lost much of its influence and certainly its bid at ever becoming a great power again. Its foreign possessions broke away and Spain shrunk. Portugal too saw a similar effect, as you can't have a peninsular war without a peninsular aftermath. The Peninsula War was generally a sudden and painful transition period for the Iberian Peninsula. Its governments were uprooted and reworked in occupation, and it had sweeping cultural impacts too. A sense of Spanish and Portuguese nationalism was spurred, and broadly the Napoleonic Wars had done this at large to every European nation. It saw the degradation of imperialism inside of Europe, and as well as intracontinental conflict. The people also got a taste of French liberalism, which paved the way for many, many 19th century revolutions and movements that helped carve our world in whatever the current year is. This is the outro, where I thank the patrons, and a tad bit more specifically, David Kendall, Thomas Curley, Steve Graham, Anal Scrubs, Ermia Rez, and Skylar Hagler. You too can become a patron. It's a lovely privilege that you get to give me money. And then if you're a lucky boy, or girl, I don't discriminate, you might receive a reward. Show the reward to your friends and family, and they'll all say, Why are you showing me this, you sad little rodent? And then you hurt. We'll need to find a coping mechanism. And what better coping mechanism is there than giving me more money on Patreon? Have I sold out enough? Good. I've got places to be. 